right now. So potentially we might make a program change and have Justin give two talks today. He was scheduled to give one tomorrow morning, but uh, he might be able to switch with Gordana and have her give her talk tomorrow morning. And he could give two talks on single division today. Uh, I haven't heard from Yao or Yvonne or anyone like that, but uh, hopefully we can make that change and, and it will go smoothly. Uh, so our first speaker this morning is Justin Johnson from NREL, and he's going to talk about single fishing. All right, thanks, Joey. Uh, thanks to everyone for getting up early and, and attending this, this lecture. Right? Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to give a talk about this, this subject, and I, I know you've sat through a lot of talks. You've probably heard single fishing mentioned once or twice, maybe more than that. Um, and maybe some discussion of, of what it is and, and how it works. And so hopefully it won't be too repetitive, um, but I think in some cases it's probably okay to hear which one of these things. Uh, so the agenda is, is to define single vision and then to discuss a little bit about the history. Um, compare it also to other multi-exiton schemes, especially multi multiple exiton generation, which you've probably heard about quite a bit. Uh, and then dive into some of the fundamentals, so discussing spin states and single and multi-exitons, uh, energy level considerations, how you manipulate energy levels and molecules to try to induce the most efficient single fission that you could. And finally, discuss uh, how you engender different types of intermolecular coupling to also get two triplets uh, from one photon, which is essentially what single fission is. So the definition, as I just sort of mentioned, is if you excite a molecule with one photon excited into a singular excited state, so this is the S star that I'm showing here. It can give up some of its energy to a neighboring chromophore or na neighboring molecule in its ground state. Of course, there are lots of ways for, for that energy to transfer between molecules, but if it does it in just the right way, then it can create a state that is essentially a combination of two triplets. And those two triplets can potentially go back and reform a singlet, a true singlet state, or they can go forward and form two totally independent triplets. And from a, from a pictorial standpoint, it looks like this. You have one photon in, exciting a molecule out of its ground state into a single excited state. It gives up some of its energy and gives that energy to a neighboring chromophore. So they end up, both molecules end up in the, in the triplet state. Um, from a historical perspective, this is, a, this is a phenomenon that's been known actually for almost 50 years. It was first postulated to occur in anthracene in 1965, and several years later, it was experimentally discovered in tetracine, crystalline tetracine. And the primary experimental observation that led people to start considering synofission as, as an active mechanism of excited state relaxation was that at low temperature, these crystals fluoresce very brightly. And then as you warm up the, warm up the crystal, the fluorescence gets quenched very strongly. And if you analyze the curve, the fluorescence quenching curve is a function of temperature and derived activation energy <coughs> from it. You get about two tenths of an AB, which happens to correlate well with two times the triplet energy minus the singlet energy. And so, with, what that has led to is that there's essentially an activation barrier to going through the double triplet state that then leads to fluorescence function. The rate that's derived from those earlier experiments was about 10 to the 10 per second, which is much faster than any other form of triplet formation mechanism that had happened in tetracine before, so inter system crossing is slower. So that's another reason that people thought this looks like single fission. And through the 70s, there were quite a few papers, a lot of studies that confirmed and, and elaborated on this topic in tetracine. And I think it was generally accepted that this is, this is what happens in tetracine and, and some of the other polyacenes. But for quite a few years, it was essentially left behind, maybe thought to only occur in these types of materials, but not be a general phenomenon. Although there were some papers when people specifically started looking for it, and things like polymers and carotenoids, there were quite a few papers that showed it's there, just maybe not always very efficient. And then in about 2004 or so, when I, when I joined NREL and Art Nozick had, had recently proposed that single fission is a lot like MEG and it actually could be useful in solar cells, at that point then people started to actually look for it. And there were quite a number of papers, and have been quite a number of papers in the last few years. Um, a lot of new groups getting into the field, looking for single fission in different molecules, and then finding it in a lot of different molecules. <clears throat> One interesting side note to the history of single fission is that it's actually been discovered also in naturally occurring photosynthetic light harvesting antenna. 
And so these are isolated from plants, and people have studied the spectroscopy of these complexes. And they've noticed that, especially in the carotenoids, they see a very fast deactivation channel, which forms triplets, and they're almost certain that this is same fission. I haven't kept up completely on the literature, but it seems like there's not necessarily a consensus as to whether plants actually use this, or, no, or it's just a, just a coincidence that it happens in these carotenoids. Uh, if, if they do use it, it's not likely a source of more electrons for the plants to use to form more fuels. Because usually plants in daylight have enough uh, electrons floating around, they don't need extra ones, especially those that are, that are in triplet state. So if it, if it has any biological significance, it's most likely in some sort of photoprotection mechanism where the, the uh, highly excited state can deactivate to lower, lower excited states and that therefore reduce the amount of energy available for things like photo damage. So as I mentioned, there are several different ways of forming multiple excitons. The fission is the one I'm focusing on. Multiple exciton generation is one we've heard a lot about. Quantum cutting is another, another mechanism uh, that I won't talk about in any detail. Uh, instead, I'll focus on uh, trying to understand the differences between single fission and MEG. So if you had a, a keen eye, you might have seen that these two diagrams, this is one we use for single fission, this is one that's used for MEG and quantum dots, they actually look extraordinarily similar. So you have one photon in, uh, that highly excited state gives up some of its energy to form another excited state. In this case, we just say it's another exciton. In this, state, in this case, we say it's a triplet. So why do, we, why do we go to all the trouble of naming them different things and talking about them in different languages? Um, the, the primary reason is that organic molecules have usually very low dielectric constants. And so there's, there's not much screening between, <coughs> between charge densities in organics. Whereas in inorganics, the screening is much larger. And there's also a large degree, of, usually a large degree of spin orbit coupling. So the consequences of those two things are that this exchange interaction, which I'll talk about in some detail in a minute, is large in molecules. So you split singlet and triplet state energies by a lot, by many tenths of an EV, sometimes over one EV. And that means that these states are distinct. You can see them spectroscopically. They're very far separated from each other. Whereas in quantum dots and other inorganic materials, those states are very close to each other. And in addition, they're mixed by spin orbit coupling. So spin orbit coupling strong means you can no longer describe, um, describe states just by their spin alone. It's a combination of the spin and the orbital angular momentum. And so you know, we don't label these as singlets and triplets. Uh, they're labeled more often as dark and bright, but they're usually split by less than a tenth of an EV. And so one of the other analogies between multiple exciton generation and single fission is, is in the reverse process. So this is the same sort of equation I showed you before, but just highlighting the reverse process, which we call triplet-triplet annihilation. And this is analogous to Auger recombination in uh, inorganic systems. And so it works essentially in the same way. If you generate two triplets, either by having a high photon intensity, so these are two different molecules, they each absorb a photon, they each produce a triplet. And given time, they can diffuse to each other. Those two triplets can annihilate and reform a singlet. Or it could happen by single fission, where you have a low light intensity, you excite just, just one dimer, let's say, in a large volume, it undergoes single fission, produces two triplets that are close to each other, they annihilate, and you get a singlet. And the experimental observable is a little bit different. So in OGA recombination, you usually look at this time-dependent bleach. You see initially a high concentration. Over time, that concentration decreases because you have exciton exciton annihilation. In single fission, you're usually looking at fluorescence. From that, from the singlet state. So initially, it's high before anything has occurred. It goes down, and then it comes up again. And people call this delayed fluorescence. And the delayed half of the fluorescence is due to this annihilation process, reforming a singlet, and then able to emit again from the from the S1 state. And one thing that's a little more unusual about molecules is that you can tune these energy levels quite a bit so that you can actually inhibit the reverse process energetically. So if you put the triplet energy low enough, then threshold for singlet fission, which is two times the triplet, is actually below this bright singlet state. So you can go this way, but it's much harder to go in the reverse direction. So you can really slow the rate of the, of the loss process. So uh, to, to go any further into the details of single fission, I thought I should at least talk about um, spin wave function. So this is something you probably are quite familiar with. Um, but I think some of the details are important here. Um, so we start from very basic, saying that Electrons with fermions, they're indistinguishable, which means that they, uh, that the wave functions that you create 
have to be anti-symmetric with respect to permutation or with respect to exchange. The overall wave function, so the spin and the space part. If you look at just initially just at the spin part, if you have two particles, or two electrons, let's say, uh, there are four different ways that you can arrange their spins. And so one of those ways, if you, if you make the wave functions, um, eigenfunctions of the exchange operator, just changing, the two, changing these two spins, these are the four eigenfunctions that you get. One of them is anti-symmetric with respect to exchange, that's a singlet. Three of them are symmetric with respect to exchange, those are the triplets. And so that's, those, that's where the name, those names come from. So if you have an anti-symmetric spin uh, wave function, that must mean that the space part has to be symmetric in order for the overall wave function to be anti-symmetric. And with the triplets, the opposite is true. Symmetric, the symmetric spin state means that you have to have an anti-symmetric um, space part of the wave function. And so the consequences of this are that there's an additional term when you calculate the energies of these states, there's an additional term that people have essentially called the exchange interaction. And, and, and it arise, arises because you have to have these wave functions that are symmetric with respect to the exchange part. And so this is the term that people talk about as the exchange interaction. It's often labeled K. And the physical significance of it is that it's essentially a, a product of two orbitals. So it's, labeled homo and lumo, homo and lumo, and that product of orbitals gives you some charge density. And these are two identical charge densities, and essentially what we're measuring here is the repulsion between those charge densities. And what that boils down to is that you can sort of draw out a cartoon of a homo and lumo, it's how much they overlap with each other. And so this sort of basic situation where you have a homo, let's say that's the red one, and the lumo is the blue one, they overlap to a great, a large degree, the singlet and the triplet, will be separated by a large energy. If they don't overlap, let's say you, when you go from a homo to a lumo, you separate the charge quite a bit and they have very little overlap, then the single and the triplet will hardly be uh, displaced from each other at all. So this is a simplistic view of why singlets and triplets separate in real molecules. Of course, the wave functions are quite complicated and often it boils down to actually having to do a quantum chemical calculation as far as figuring out exactly what that exchange interaction is and how much singlets and triplets split from each other, but there are some Sort of guiding principles that, that we can use to find classes of molecules that we think either have a large or a small exchange interaction. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But there's one additional thing that arises if you have two triplet excitons. So instead of just having two spins to worry about, now we have four spins to worry about. And if you combine those two triplet excitons in the various ways that you can, you end up with nine different states. You have one singlet, three triplets, and five quintets. Um, and actually, so this is the S equals zero, S equals one, S equals two states. And in actuality, you don't necessarily just have one, three, and five. All of those states are, are very close to each other energetically, usually, and so they mix with each other. And so you actually have nine states that could have uh, a combination of any amount of those. Uh, just that the coefficients all have to add up for the single case of one, three, and five. So you have this manifold of nine closely spaced states, usually, that are a mixture of different spin states. And so what's kind of unique about that is that normally this Jablonski diagram that people talk about for how when you excite a molecule with a photon, what are the different ways that the molecule can decay? Usually you talk about singlets and triplets, but if you can undergo singlet fission and have two triplet excitons next to each other, all of a sudden you have to start talking also about this quintet state, this higher, this higher spin state. So if this is now part of the language of uh, molecular spectroscopy, then maybe we have to revise the Jablonski diagram a little bit to include some of the some of the other spin states. So what's actually important about those other spin states is that they can actually be used in an experiment to prove that you do or do not have single fission. So uh, if you just have two spins, uh, there's not a magnetic field dependence uh, to, to, let's say, spin orbit coupling, which would just be going from a single to a triplet. But if you have these two triplets interacting and you have these nine states of differing spin, if you apply a magnetic field, the Zeeman interaction starts to split the states depending upon the degree of the, um, the coefficients of the singlet, triplet, and quintet. So they can all, as you increase the magnetic field, they can all converge or diverge from each other. So in tetracine, this was actually one of the first experiments that was used to prove that singlet fission was occurring. So it was known in tetracine what some of these states were, lo were looking like and what their energies were. And when a magnetic field was applied along a specific direction of a crystal, it was known that at least two of these states were converging. And it was also known that the singlet fission rate, the rate of this forward process, is essentially the number of states in this manifold of nine spin substates that have singlet character to 
So you can imagine if you're starting in a singlet, going to a singlet is going to give you this largest matrix element. So if you have one of those, you have a relatively small rate. If you have five of those, you have a relatively large rate. So it was known that there were at least two of these, but as you applied the magnetic field, two of these converged and created two pure spin states, one a singlet, one a singlet, one a quintet. So you went from at least two states down to one. That caused the single fission rate to decrease, and that caused the delayed fluorescence to decrease also. Delayed fluorescence is the, essentially the signature that you have single fission going on. And so this was reproduced in other crystals, and it's, it's now sort of known, at least in single crystals, as a way of proving that you have single fission because it's, it takes advantage of the fact that you must have these two triplet excitons interacting with each other. So I was going to try to use the clicker uh, for this. So let's see, let's see if it works. Maybe pull up the, uh, the PowerPoint again. This one? Oh, I mean the PowerPoint. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not fully honest. This is right. <laughs> singlet to a singlet, as I mentioned before. And so that, by definition, is internal conversion. It's a special form because it's not a, not a true singlet. It's, a, it's two triplets that are coupled overall. Their spin is a, is a singlet. Over time, you can have things like inter-system crossing to go for those two triplets to come, to come back and become independent triplets or singlets or any spin state that they want. So there's secondary processes that occur that aren't necessarily internal conversion, but that first process is internal conversion. So that's right. Okay, so uh, this is sort of the second part of the talk, and it's uh, using some of the principles that I discussed to now design molecules, or design systems that have the right single triplet energy level splitting and the, and the right intermolecular coupling so that you could actually have a chance of seeing this phenomenon in a particular molecule. So of course we're going to look at the, eventually the yield of single fission, that's the, that's the parameter that we're most interested in, in uh, optimizing. So energy level splitting is, is the first topic. So the first question is, what do you what do you want? Do you want small or do you want large ex exchange splitting? So do you want the singlets and triplets to be separated by a large energy or a small one? So if you just examine the consequences of each, so we'll start with small. So for small splitting, single fission is exergic uh, only from a very highly excited singlet state. So if you put your uh, if you have your photon resonant with S1 and you put an electron here. There's not enough energy to go all the way up to the single fission threshold at two times the triplet energy. Um, so that is potentially negative. It means that single fission will have to compete with a very fast process of just cooling, or vibrational relaxation within the molecule. So that's not necessarily the best situation. But from a practical standpoint, there are some advantages. Uh, for example, if you imagine putting this system into a solar cell, uh, anytime you don't get absorption from S0 to T1. It's a spin-forbidden transition, so there's no absorption there. And of course, there is absorption as soon as you go from S0 to S1. And so any energy in the range between S1 and T1 is essentially lost or transparent in your, in your solar cell because you're creating, you're creating excitons here, but you're only starting to absorb up here. 
So that's a that's a loss of potential energy. And so that's um, that's a negative. But because of the, the exchange of splitting is so small here, there's essentially no loss. So for some solar cell applications, you can imagine this being the, the more optimal situation. And this is essentially just like MEG. So what about a large ex exchange splitter? Uh, in that case, then, fission is exorigic from the relaxed S1 state, so that two times the T1 threshold is now right here, maybe even a little bit below S1. And so now, single fission is only competing with things like fluorescence, things that have a nanosecond time constant. And so there's a much better chance that you'll be able to be competitive with those kinds of uh, relaxation processes. The negative is just the inverse of what I said earlier. It's that this, in this region, in this range, there's, there's no absorption. So when you absorb here, you're generating your excitons here, but you're not absorbing any of these photons. What that means, essentially, is that if for any solar cell or, or photoelectrochemical application, you're going to need to have two layers, one that undergoes single fission and one that doesn't necessarily go into single fission, but absorbs in this, in this range where your single fission chromophore does not. And so I have a couple pictures of that. This is just sort of a real illustration of what I just said. So case A is the case where the exchange splitting is small, we have to compete with uh, cooling. So, exciting up into the, the single efficient threshold, you've got a large density of states, different molecular states, and you get fast cooling down to S1 before single efficient occurs. Usually that means this rate is high, this yield is quite low. However, if you have a, a large ex exchange splitting, all of a sudden the threshold is much lower, and you're undergoing this process from the very edge of the density of states, and so this rate. Um, the rate of singlet decay is slow, so single fission has a chance to compete because it's only competing with fluorescence. And so that's the situation where we think the, we might have the chance of seeing the highest yield. And so pictorially, this is, this is what it would look like if you made a solar cell. This, this comes right out of a paper from Matt Beers. You've probably seen this plot before. Essentially, in the case A, you can make a single junction, single layer solar cell, and it would have the same optimum uh, efficiency characteristics that an MEG solar cell would have. Um, but in the case of case B, where you have this uh, much larger exchange splitting, as I mentioned, you have to have two layers. It can still be a fairly simple design, a fairly simple solar cell, but it has to have two layers. And the first layer is the one that undergoes single fission. The second one absorbs that red light that went through the first layer, doesn't have to undergo single fission, just produces one exciton per photon. But add those up, and then you get uh, fairly high yield, something like 50, or 46 percent uh, in the sort of optimal situation. So these are uh, more detailed designs of how you might actually take advantage of single fission. Uh, again, this is sort of the MEG stair step case, or this is the low, low exchange splitting case, would be this M2 case. The large exchange splitting case would be this case, uh, single fission case here. And so these designs are based on this, this lower diagram, so taking advantage of the, the large exchange splitting, but knowing you have to have two layers. Um, and so again, the first layer absorbs blue, green light generates two excitons per photon, and they get transferred to something like TiO2, disensitized solar cell. The second layer would absorb the red light, generate just one exciton per photon. This is a photoelectrochemical cell, in particular, uh, splitting water. So in this case, the currents, the photocurrents would add up, and you can see you get a gain because of the photocurrents adding. In this case, it's essentially the photovoltages that would add and give you enough potential to split water and create uh, hydrogen and oxygen from water. The idea is the same, though. In this case, you could have one, you could have a second layer that also generates multiple excitons. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what types of molecules might actually have this condition of this large exchange splitting. So there are several different classes, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. So the first class is, is alternate hydrocarbons. So the name is, is almost exactly as it sounds. It's a simple definition. Essentially, it's a hydrocarbon where you can designate two classes of molecules, two classes of carbon atoms. And None of those, in, in each class, uh, none of the atoms are neighbors with each other. So any linear uh, hydrocarbon, like this conjugated hydrocarbon like this, have alternating carbon atoms that are not neighbors of each other. And so they're automatically alternate hydrocarbons. And there are other types that I'll talk about in a second. What's sort of a long-winded description of this, but the, what comes out of it is that when you calculate what the orbitals look like, they all have the amplitude on each carbon atom is, is the same. And so what that means is that you have an optimal overlap between, for example, homo and homo. That optimal overlap, overlap, if you remember from a few slides ago, means that you'll have the largest exchange interaction and the largest single triplet splitting that you can have for a molecule of this type. 
So we'll be looking, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking for molecules that have this kind of uh, structure. And polyacenes are a one type, and it's probably not a coincidence that the very early studies of syncretion happened in, in things like anthracene, tetracene, pentacene. These are alternate hydrocarbons. And so I stole these plots from a paper from Greg Stoles and, and Gary Rose from a number of years ago because they plotted out the single triplet splitting for, for these uh, polyacenes and polyenes uh, as a function of what they call confinement length, essentially just making longer chains. <coughs> and what you notice, first of all, is the single triplet splitting is really large. So it's on the order of one and a half to about three dB for the smallest polyenes and uh, polyacenes. So that's a very that's a very large splitting. But what you also notice is for the smallest molecules, the S0 to S1 excitation energy is also really large. It's three or four dB. So even though in anthracene, for example, the single triplet splitting might be <coughs> one and a half, approaching two dB, the S0 to S1 splitting is so large that the single fission threshold is still well above S1. So even though this has a large exchange splitting, it's still not sufficient to give you the condition where single fission is downhill from S1. So you have to go to a larger uh, system. So tetracene, pentacene, and it turns out that pentacene, if you follow this curve, this is the S0 to S1 excitation energy sort of marching down as you make it, as you make the molecule longer. And this is kind of like a, essentially it is a particle in a box problem. As you make it longer, the energy levels, the energies come down and down. And by the time you get to pentacene, the S1 energy has come down so low, and the single triplet splitting has stayed reasonably high. You can see the slope of this curve is much less than the slope of this, such that two times the triplet energy is now, <coughs> and it's now below S1. <coughs> so we have this condition where single fission is exorigic from the S1 state. And pentacene is a is a molecule that people have been studying a lot, like a lot recently, partially because of this preferential energy alignment. So there's another class of molecules. Uh, that's quite different. So, on this side of this diagram, this is this would be like the alternate the alternate hydrocarbon that I talked about. First approximation: singlets and triplets are the same energy. You, you add an exchange, and you try to maximize this this uh, overlap such that the triplet comes down as low as possible with respect to the singlet. So, this is the strategy for alternate hydrocarbons. But in biorapticals, the situation is different. So, we take a look at structures like this that have these dot dot resonance structures that you can draw. And the larger contribution the dot dot resonance structure is to the, to the actual um, structure of the molecule, the more the molecule has biradical character. What that means is that each of these electrons is essentially sitting by itself in, a, in an orbital that's degenerate with the other one. And so you can imagine in that case there's not necessarily a driving force or a requirement that the electrons be paired with each other. <coughs> they can be in these two separate orbitals, unpaired or paired. Uh, and the energy will be pretty much the same either way. And so, Typically what happens is that this is not the only structure, so the structure has some partial biradical character, um, but the more that it has, the lower the triplet energy is. And it comes up, of course, when you make real molecules that don't have full biradical character, but usually if you find a molecule, a parent molecule that looks like this, and you functionalize it, usually the triplet, triplet energy will stay quite low. So this is another strategy to look for molecules that have this correct energy level structure. And so that's one thing that, that we look for, um, in some of our early studies, we were looking for molecules that, that had this biradical character. So this is a polyortho quinodimethane radical. So it has a, a dot dot structure to it, where the two um, two electrons are sitting here in these positions. Um, if you stabilize it, so you close the ring with an oxygen, it becomes isobenzofuran, which is a known molecule. It still has a lot of this biradical character to it. And if you functionalize it further and make a molecule that actually absorbs visible light. We get this diphenyl isobenzofuran. Uh, and the molecule itself still maintains a reasonable amount of biradical character, and so its triplet energy by, by calculation and by experiment is still very low. And so this is a this is a situation where we think we use these principles to find a molecule, a somewhat somewhat practical molecule that actually has the right energy level structure. So I'll try this again. Um, so this is the question, I'll read it first. Which situation is most likely to produce exo-rigid? Exoergic single fission. Uh, push pull chromophore molecule with radical character, a large conjugated hydrocarbon with an even number of carbon atoms, small conjugated hydrocarbon with an even number of carbon atoms, or a molecule with heavy atoms. Let me, let me make sure I got this started with 
get the question. Census was C, it's becoming even more of a consensus. Um, and that's right, so I, I maybe didn't explain everything in, in full detail, uh, as I probably should have, but you had to kind of guess a little bit on this one. But um, the larger the hydrocarbon, if it has an even number of carbon atoms, so it's an alter, alternate hydrocarbon, the better the chances that that single triplet splitting is really large. Um, and the other answer is, uh, there's, there's something wrong with all the other answers. So um, the other part of this uh, molecular design part of the talk is, is intermolecular coupling. So in order to discuss intermolecular coupling, it's important to understand a little bit more about the, the single fission mechanism. And so um, this looks daunting, but it's actually really, really simple. Um, essentially, we're designing a Hamiltonian where we're just going to have the, the smallest number of states we need to describe this situation. Uh, so we're going to have four total states. And we're going to pretend for the moment that this only could happen in a dimer system. So you just have a uh, homo lumo of, of two different dimers coupled to each other. So those are the four states. And you can excite either one half or the other half of the dimer with a photon. And pathways to form two triplets are, are there are two of them. One of them is to transfer one electron from one of the halves of the dimer to the other, and then transfer from here back to the other and form two triplets. So that would what would be called a sequential mechanism, so two electron transfers. The other way is just to go directly, so to push two electrons at the same time into the right position so that you get uh, the double triplet state. So the Hamiltonian contains all those, all those terms, some of them are essentially duplicates of each other. The, the red ones are the direct terms you can see going from the locally excited singlet state to two triplets. And the indirect terms go from locally excited singlet to CA stands for cat cation with anion pair essentially made two charged species when you undergo this charge transfer. And the second step of that two-step process is to go from that cation anion pair to the double triplet state. And I'll talk about both of these um, pathways in a little more detail. So the direct, uh, the direct single fission mechanism, this is that matrix element I showed you. And if you build a very, if you assume some very simple things about your molecules in terms of what the excitations look like, homo to lumo excitations are the ones we're considering, and this matrix element has this form to it. Um, and it again is fairly simple. You're taking two orbitals, this time LUMO of molecule A, LUMO of molecule B. So those are orbitals. You're multiplying them together to get a charge density. And you have another charge density here, HOMO of B, LUMO of A. So you're essentially saying, or asking, how much do these two charge densities repel each other? And there are two of those terms, and they're separated by a minus. So if you calculate, those terms, assuming the homo lumos are essentially just blobs, or the simplest homo lumo you can imagine, uh, and you arrange your chromophores in different ways, you get some intuition about what's the best way to arrange them. So these are two molecules, and if you link them linearly, you can imagine that the orbitals are only going to overlap in the position where they're, they're almost linked. Everywhere else, there's essentially going to be no overlap. And so both of these terms are going to be very small, they might be non-zero right here, but again, because of the symmetry of this thing and the minus, it's just going to cancel. And this, this matrix element will be essentially zero. Um, if you stack the molecules on top of each other, you can imagine the over orbital overlap is going to be quite large. Uh, again, But again, because of the symmetry of the situation, uh, the, those uh, contributions are essentially going to cancel. You're going to get zero for this matrix element. But if you stack them and then slip them or make them offset from each other, 
Uh, if you examine the situation, you don't get a perfect cancellation. You get reasonably large orbital overlap, but you don't get a cancellation. And so this matrix element all of a sudden becomes something non-zero. And so this has been, this is just sort of toying around with boxes and things like that, but this has been calculated for some real molecules um, using quantum chemical calculations. And it, it was found that essentially you get zero for that interaction, the matrix element, when the molecules are perfectly stacked on each other. But if you slip them in one direction or the other, you start to get a reasonably large uh, value. So this is a, a couple of MeV at some fraction of the fraction of the angstrom separation. So if we assume that Fermi's golden rule is is uh, available to be used here, essentially the rate of single fission will be proportional to the square of this matrix element. So the interaction we found is, is on the order of a couple of MeV. That's actually pretty small. And so you imagine that the rate of the direct single fission is pretty slow. So not in the femtosecond range, but maybe in the picosecond or nanosecond range. So molecules that look like this with the slip stacking, and this is, a, this is an example of another one, could have single fission rates in, in, the, in the range of inverse picoseconds to maybe inverse nanoseconds. And, and lots of times that's fast enough to give you uh, efficient single fission. One of the reasons that we think that uh, that matrix element is so small is essentially it's a second order perturbation. It's moving two electrons at the same time. And so generally second order um, perturbations like that are much weaker than first order. And so the indirect pathway is, is essentially two first order perturbations stacked next to each other. So first you undergo the charge transfer and then you go a second, undergo a second charge transfer. So this is what it looks like. One charge transfer here and then you come out very well with a second charge transfer here. If the spins are aligned right, you have two triplets. And so that's, that's how that, that one works, but there are kind of two ways of doing that. Um, and it depends on the energy of that intermediate state. So that intermediate state is talked about as a, as a cation anion pair. So two charged species next to each other. Um, in some cases, in a totally nonpolar environment, you can imagine in the gas phase, the energy of that species is very high because those charges aren't stabilized at all. But in a highly polar medium, and solvent that has a, a large dielectric constant, the, the energy of that charge species becomes very low. Those dipoles in the solvent can stabilize those charges. And so you have two, two ways of thinking about this. You can have the, the, the electrons are transferred forward and back in a concerted fashion, and that can still happen even if that energy of the intermediate is very high. So that's, that's what we call the concerted mechanism. And the intermediate then is virtual. You never actually spend any time in that highly excited charge transfer state. You just use it to undergo the, the concerted charge transfer. Sequential occurs when the energy between the cation anion state and the starting state, the S1 state, is smaller. And then you actually have a chance to have population in that cation anion state, and you can, you can actually observe that state. And we've done this for some of these molecules. If you put this molecule into, make it into a dimer, you notice that in polar solvents, you see a rise in a, in a species that we've identified that is this cation anion species. And so then, as that decays, it forms triplets. So this is the this is the real intermediate in this sort of two-step uh, indirect mechanism. There's another mechanism that uh, you may have heard about from Charles Musgrave, um, and it's it's a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to go into detail because it's sort of, it's computationally intensive and a little harder to my my opinion, harder to wrap your mind around. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless, and it might be active in, in many systems. And it, essentially, it says that single fission starts with evolution from a bright uh, bright singlet state to a dark excited state that has double triplet character to it. Um, these are kind of quantum, quantum mechanical terms, but essentially what it boils down to is um, in a state like, in a system like pentacene crystal, you have this highly delocalized uh, excited state, so it exists over many molecules. And this can be thought of somewhat analogously to a situation in these linear polyenes that was discussed many, many years ago, theoretically. So the, the normal first excited singlet state, which is one excitation, you kind of describe it as each carbon atom has an electron on it and they're spin paired, so that overall this is just a singlet, all singlets. But if you flip a spin here or there, you have local regions that have triplet character to them. Overall, this is still a singlet, but it, it's sort of a doubly excited singlet. That's two regions that have triplet character to them. So this is a much simpler example than this, but I think the ideas are, are similar, and that you can imagine in some cases with highly delocalized states, you have essentially an evolution from one quantum state to the other. So, one more question. Let me get this over here. 
direct mechanism of single fission involves a two electron perturbation of the dimer Hamiltonian intermediate state, uh, two one electron perturbations, a dark doubly excited state, or absorption of two photons. So it does look like uh, most, or the, the right answer is, is A, and more people did choose that answer than A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, so I, I realized I do throw out quite a bit of, uh, maybe not necessarily unfamiliar language, but, but language you don't necessarily use every day. Um, so the direct mechanism is this two electron perturbation. Uh, so it's going from a state that is a local singlet to one that has two triplets on it without an intermediate step. So it's not charge transfer and another charge transfer. Those would be two one electron perturbation. This is pushing two electrons at the same time uh, to the double triplet state. And so uh, there is no state with that polar character. Um, again, it's not two one electron perturbations. Um, this is just sort of a different topic altogether, and we're only absorbing one photon in this case. So we're back. So we talked a bit about the mechanism of single fission. And um, I see that I'm kind of getting to the end of, of the time that I should probably use for this first talk. And since I am giving a talk again right after this, I don't necessarily have to churn through the rest of the slides. I'll end here just by saying that, um, so now we know a little bit about the mechanism. We know about some of the things that we want to design into the molecules um, to have the right energy levels. So how do we design chromophores that couple to each other in such a way that we can induce fast single fission. So there's several ways. Of course, I've shown you some examples of dimers. We can do that. We can make crystals. They, inter they have molecules that interact with each other. In some cases, people can make uh, aggregates, which are less ordered uh, systems. So I'm going to skip a couple of slides. And just, I'll just leave it here. I was kind of expecting this to be the end of my talk for the day. But um, there are a couple of articles that I think would be useful for you to read if you're interested in further information. This chemical reviews article is, is very comprehensive, written by my colleague Joseph Mickle. Uh, there was an earlier paper from Art Nozick that discusses some of the practical implications. This is from, from 2006, and we'll have another article out really soon that kind of gives it an overview of the, of the field now. Um, and this is a lead into the next, the next uh, part of my talk, which will happen in 15 minutes or so. So thanks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. solar cell, um, just molecules floating around in solution are not likely to be the best situation. So you can study them on uh, attached to a substrate like TiO2, or you can make crystals of them and make like bilayers or, or uh, thin layers that are more realistic. So those are probably the two, two ways we study the most. Yes. So Joseph, in the show, the collection of TiO2, so you can get two of them. But the signal is extremely high, and usually the signal is injected incredibly quickly in the TiO2. So, one of the ideas to get around that, or isn't it a problem, is that you are converting fast enough to compete with that ultra fast already process? Yeah, I think, I think you already mentioned a couple of ways. So, one is we hope that single vision is so fast that it would compete. But if it isn't, you can imagine um, designing systems that have things like spacers in them. Uh, so that the singlet injection is not necessarily that fast. You can kind of design the chromophores in a way that you hope that 
when you make the two triplets, they have the, a chance of injecting, but the singlet state maybe doesn't have a very fast rate. That's, that's kind of a little bit future research for us at this point, but we're thinking about it. Basically, a more complicated molecule. Probably a more complicated molecule, yeah. Okay, I guess we can take a quick coffee break and then come back and we'll get single vision part two.